Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Nico. I'm working as an architect at Amadeus. Uh, today I'll present you how we managed to deploy a couch-based cluster in OpenShift. I'm very happy to share this presentation with Gabriel, who is principal uh, solution architect at Red Hat, Hello. and Anil, who is a principal product manager at, at Couchbase. So here is our agenda for today. In the first section, I will first present you what is Amadeus, so you understand what we're doing, what is our business. And then I'll explain you why we're trying to deploy data stores in OpenShift. In the second section, Gabriel will explain you what are the stateful sets, which are a new feature in OpenShift. In the next section, Anil will explain you how Couchbase used stateful sets uh, to, to deliver our solution. And in the last section, I'll just explain you the next steps and what we, what we plan to do. All right, so let's start. I told you I would explain to you what is Amadeus. So that's the official slide from the brand with all the business units and everything we do. I'm not gonna go through each of them because I don't have the time. But I'll, instead of that, I'll just give you a short story to show you how Amadeus, uh, what kind of services that uh, Amadeus are providing. And I'll focus only on the airline business. So let's think about the next time you want to go on holiday and you want to take a flight, maybe to Paris, let's say. Uh, you're gonna go to a website to check the flight availability. There is a high chance that uh, the, what the, the service that the website is targeting is actually Amadeus availability services to, to tell you what seats are available on all the, on all the flights. Uh, maybe you're gonna use you know, these meta search services to, to see different uh, possibilities of price depending on the day, that's also Amadeus. Probably you don't decide to pay right away, you wait a couple of weeks before to, to get your ticket, you come back to the website, and then the price of the ticket has changed. That's Amadeus Revenue Management System that is here to maximize the benefits of the airlines. So this time you book, you book your, your flight, that's probably Amadeus booking uh, service that is running behind. Then you wait for the date of your departure, you go to the airport, first thing you do is to check in, that's also a service that Amadeus is providing, you get your ticket printed, that's also Amadeus uh, ticket services, printing ticket services. Uh, then you have your luggage and you hand it over to, to the airline company. That's also Amadeus that will route your luggage uh, till your arrival. And actually the way your luggage is placed inside the, the airplane uh, to reduce, to optimize the fuel consumption of the, uh, of the airplane is also a service that Amadeus provides. So you can see we provide a lot of things in the travel industry, we're actually uh, the leader. And here I only focused on the airline business. But you can imagine that we're doing the same for hotels, for car rentals, and for everything. So it's a pretty huge company. Here are some numbers uh, from last year. So for instance, we have half, uh, we, we processed half a billion, billion bookings in 2016. Uh, we process 50,000 end user queries every second. So end user is really the traveler, but you can imagine that in our systems, each single query for end user can translate to hundreds of query internally. Uh, just to give you a, a quick number on our availability cache that is running on Couchbase, uh, we take about three million queries per second. So that's, that's a, a lot of traffic to, to take. You can imagine that to run all these applications and to handle all this traffic, we have uh, thousands and thousands of application servers. Most of them are running in our data center in Germany, uh, but we also have some applications now that are running in a data center in the US. Uh, we are also running some stuff on the cloud, but really the, the, still the historical uh, data center is the one we have in Germany. We have three operational sites, one in Germany, one in, uh, one in the US, and one in Australia. This way we can provide uh, global support to our customers better. Uh, so of course you understand that all these application servers are processing, processing a lot of data and they're logging actually over 100 terabytes of compressed data uh, every day. And of course to store this data, we have hundreds of data stores. So you can see here a subset of all the type of data stores that we're running uh, internally. And of course, when you are running with such a large scale, it's common sense that you need to automate everything you can. It's the only way to survive. You know, you want to, to reduce your, your cost, to, to be more efficient, so you need to automate everything you can. For our applications, 
is the, the, the solution we picked is OpenShift, so we want to deploy all our applications in OpenShift, and that's okay. Uh, but for our data stores, we were not really sure what we wanted to do. You know, we were st still relying on homemade scripts that we had to maintain to do the upgrades to, to deploy uh, our, uh, our data stores. And we wanted to, 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 to be better, to be more efficient okay, in deploying these data stores. So when we talk about automating all the things, that's a good idea, but uh, the, first thing to, the first thing to wonder is what should be automated concretely. So it took, it took us about five years to have a complete list of operational requirements that we want to fulfill every time we, uh, we take a new data store on board. Every time we say, this is a new data store that we want to use at Amadeus, uh, it has to comply and to fulfill all these operational requirements before going to production. And you will see these requirements are probably common to any company. Uh, it's things like uh, being able to install it uh, with a single command line, or to do the upgrade, or to scale it out, uh, to monitor it, and all those things. That's, that's really common to, to anyone in the industry and to any data store. It doesn't depend on the kind of data store. It's always the same things that you have to, to, to implement. Uh, doing this ourselves cost us about 400 man days. So every time there is a new type of data store that we want to standardize and to industrialize, that's something we have to invest to, uh, to implement all these things. So it's, it has a huge cost initially, and then we have to maintain everything we developed. And the maintenance cost is also quite heavy. So you understand what we want to automate regarding data stores. Now, what are the, solution to, the solutions to automate all these things? So luckily for us, all the data store companies are providing several automation solutions. So they all have Puppet modules and Siebel playbooks, uh, Salt, don't really know what's the name, uh, scripts, uh, REST API, command line interfaces, you name it. But the thing is, there is not one single solution that fulfills all our requirements. You know, maybe you can uh, deploy your cluster with Puppet, but then you will need the REST API to retrieve the, to retrieve the metrics, and then the backup restore, you will do it with a command line interface. So there is, there is not one single solution that provides everything we need for all the data stores. So that's uh, the need we identified. We were looking for this common interface that can abstract the data store from, the, from, uh, from an ops. You know, because you don't really care what's the kind of data store. If you want to, to deploy it, to create the cluster, you don't really have to be an expert. You just go through this, through this common interface. You say, okay, create me a cluster. I don't really care how it works, how it's done, but just do it for me, and then it will do it. So we tried to think about what was the right way, where, what was already available in the industry to provide this common interface. And we thought, yeah, we, we're using OpenShift for our applications, so probably we can try to use it uh, as well for our data stores. The good thing is that most of our, of our requirements, so everything we talked about, installing, upgrading, uh, scaling out, is already enforced by design. As soon as you deploy something in OpenShift, you already have a clear way, a clear procedure to do, to do your upgrade and to scale out and to be resilient. You, you get your pod uh, dynamically rescheduled on, on another node. So that's already enforced by design in OpenShift. And ideally, what we want to achieve is that the compliance of a data store to OpenShift would become sufficient for our company to take on board a new, a new technology. So let's say these days we're talking about Splunk. Ideally, tomorrow, uh, the sales guy from Splunk comes to Amadeus and say, hey, our data store is compliant with OpenShift. You can already do everything you want through OpenShift to interact with Splunk. And we know immediately how to install it, how to upgrade it, how to scale it out. We, we don't have to be experts in Splunk to already start using it uh, directly. So that's what we would like to achieve. The advantage is that it saves us the standardization cost, so the 400 man days that I talked about in the previous slide. And also, it reduces the need of experts, because if today you have five different data stores in your, in your data center, you need at the very least uh, 10 experts. Two per data store, you have the main point of contact and the backup when the main guy is off. So you need 10 guys. If tomorrow uh, you can manage your data stores through OpenShift, you just need one guy who knows OpenShift and can do all the basic stuff. 
and then you still need one expert per data store if you have a, a bad problem to solve on, on your data store. But you don't need any more, you don't need that much experts uh, as before. The other good thing is that uh, the maintenance of all these scripts, of all this automation, would be now done by the data stores. So they take care of maintaining it and uh, they make sure they are compliant with every new major release. That's not something every company has to do uh, on its own. Uh, so what we did, that, that was the idea. I think you understand why we're trying to deploy data stores in OpenShift. We want to automate everything, uh, I mean, as much as we can. And OpenShift, OpenShift sounds like a, a good solution. So what we did is to contact different uh, data store uh, vendors. And uh, Couchbase is one of our strategic data store that we, we use in all our, our projects. And we have a good relationship with them. So we presented the, the idea and they were into the idea. Red Hat was into the idea. So we set up a project team with people from each company to work on this project. And it was very precious to us uh, to have people from Couchbase and from Red Hat. So from Red Hat because we were using at the beginning of the project uh, alpha features from OpenShift, so the stateful sets, for instance. And we needed the support from, uh, from Red Hat to, to understand what's the right way to use them. You know? And also we needed to work with Couchbase because in the end, the idea is the solution we're providing should be reusable by anyone in the industry and it should be supported by Couchbase in production and it should be maintained by Couchbase. So that's why we, we needed to work with them. But of course, uh, it's, not, it's not straightforward to do it. You know, OpenShift is more a stateless framework, so it works well with applications. But with data stores, you have to handle the data. Its clusters are quite stat stateful. So it's not straightforward to, to, to come up with this solution. And in the next uh, section, Gabriel will explain us how stateful sets help us uh, to solve all our problems. <coughs> So as, as Nicola was saying, uh, OpenShift is mainly for, from, from its origin, uh, the version 3.0 of OpenShift uh, is uh, mainly to manage stateless applications. So when you deploy applications on OpenShift, you deploy them into, into, into pods that are assembled and uh, deployed by what we call in OpenShift a master that will schedule the different pods and scale them depending on uh, the needs uh, of, uh, of the application. So whatever the type of application, uh, you have the same model for scaling those applications. And uh, this gives you a, a, a great advantage in terms of, uh, in term of operability of the, of the solution. And if you look at this slide, you'll discover that each application, if you, you have two, uh, two color of application, um, a blue one, a red one. So each application could have uh, different instances, which are the different uh, um, um, uh, sets of the application that are clustered. And uh, those uh, applications are exposed to the external world through a routing layer of OpenShift. And if we need, uh, in OpenShift, uh, storage for this application, we could relate those applications to what we call a persistent volume. So there is a pers persistent volume claim to reclaim to OpenShift. At, uh, so OpenShift reclaims some kind of uh, storage that is connected to the application. Uh, when applications are, are deployed in a standard way in OpenShift, it consists of uh, saying this application has a number of replica, and OpenShift, or a minimum of replica and a maximum of replica, and OpenShift will handle the scaling of this application, scaling up the application, down the application, depending on, depending on the workload. This works fine for uh, cloud-native applications, which are mainly stateless, but what, we, what if we need to have stateful applications? So what is a stateful application? A stateful application is an application that needs a state. State is mainly stored in memory, on, on a disk, or perhaps in bus. And if it's, uh, it's an easy, it's an, there's other different uh, level of, uh, of storing the state of the application. One way is storing the state in the memory. Another way is storing it in a database. A third way is storing it in bus. So if it's only about storing the, the state of the application memory, we could do this since 3.0 of OpenShift, which, which we uh, provided two years ago, using uh, memory, uh, memory caching techniques. But for, 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 uh, for storing the data uh, and coupling the data that is, that is in memory 
two data that might be stored on a persistent volume, um, we need to figure out how to scale those data stores in a very specific way. Because uh, data stores have uh, some kind of uh, um, um, uh, um, needs in terms of uh, the way they address this storage and uh, sometimes they need a very specific way of ordering uh, the way you launch the different instances that belong to the same cluster and uh, making sure that the different instances of the same cluster know uh, the other instance uh, in terms of identification and uh, where those instances are deployed. So. Uh, to resolve this, we have uh, created uh, in, um, in Kubernetes uh, and uh, OpenShift uh, upstream community, what we call a stateful set, which was named the pet set uh, in the previous uh, releases, uh, in order to provide for each instance of an application deployed on uh, using pet set, a unique ID, a unique network ID, a unique storage, persistent storage, and um, and uh, to give the capability to deploy this different, those different pods that, differ, depend, that relate to the same application in a very specific order and to shut down these pods in a very specific order. So why this? If we look at, uh, at uh, how Couchbase manage the different um, instance of a Couchbase server, uh, Couchbase handle uh, data in, uh, in what we call buckets which are shards of data, and when the Couchbase is clustered, each bucket could have its uh, uh, an active uh, set of data and a passive set of data. So if um, we deploy, for instance, 10 instances of, of, uh, of Couchbase, which are deployed into uh, containers that are in, uh, in pods managed by OpenShift, we need to make sure that those 10 instances know each other, and each instance know the ID of its replica. For instance, in this, uh, in this slide, we have pod one that has its replica in pod three, in pod seven, uh, which means that the buckets that are stored by pod one in uh, server one uh, has a, um, a passive copy of this data in pod seven. And we need to make sure that uh, pod one know the ID of pod seven, and both of them, each, uh, each instance of Couchbase server has its own persistent volume. So two, two, uh, two important feature of uh, stateful set for Couchbase is uh, the unique identif identification of an instance of a, of, a, of a server and a unique storage for each pod that, is, that belong to the same cluster. So if we add the additional um, <clears throat> instance of Couchbase, Couchbase will, min will manage what we called the rebalancing of the cluster, copying some data to other instances. But when the rebalancing is done, we need to make sure that the new instances of Couchbase are uniquely identified, which is a feature of stateful sets. And uh, if we, uh, we look into what happens if one pods on one node fails, uh, Couchbase, since it knows where are the replica of the data, it will only uh, activate those replica on the available server and uh, until the different uh, missing pods get started on the additional server. So using a stateful set with Couchbase give a standard way to operate uh, uh, Couchbase using Kubernetes features. So Anil is going to present a different feature of Couchbase. All right, uh, thanks Gabriel. So again, I'm Manil Kumar, uh, Principal Product Manager at Couchbase. So, <clears throat> so the, uh, before I get into the weeds of uh, how this Couchbase runs on the OpenShift platform, I want to just quickly give a quick overview of Couchbase. I think some of you here uh, are new to the Couchbase, right? So, uh, just a quick overview. Couchbase is a data platform. It provides a data platform, a single platform, and uh, with all the different technologies, right? So, it is a document distributed document data store, and uh, it supports natively supports JSON documents in Couchbase. Right? It also can be used as a KV store. It can also be used as an in-memory database. Right? 
we have a SQL-like query language uh, which works on the JSON documents, so we use the, uh, basically the power of SQL on JSON documents. Uh, we have a wide range of indexing capabilities. We also have a powerful replication between, within the cluster, across the cluster, and between the edge devices. So we have a lighter version of Couchbase which runs on the edge devices, on the mobile devices, right? And we have the synchronization technology which replicates data back to the cluster. And we are adding more and more capabilities such as full text search capability and analytics which are in developer preview right now, but uh, will be uh, GA soon, right? Again, I just wanted to give a quick overview of Couchbase. Um, and the next slide, which I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture, and it's kind of uh, very relevant to this discussion here. So nowadays, we uh, hear about all these cool technologies like Docker, Container, Kubernetes, and which are optimizing, which is basically uh, uh, adding more optimization to the uh, previous technologies, right? In, in some sense, like in database, we are also, and, and so we hear about these uh, terminologies like lightweight, uh, uh, scheduling, powerful orchestration, and also about uh, the isolation, right? In database industry, so we are also, it's kind of transforming again, right? So uh, we are doing some lot of things in the database. Uh, if I tell you that Couchbase uh, is a, Couchbase cluster is a uh, masterless, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, shared nothing architecture, you would be like, mm, so what? Because there are so many other databases which, is, which are also peer-to-peer, -peer, masterless, shared nothing architecture. But if I tell you uh, Couchbase, has this modern microservice architecture, you would be interested, right? So this is what uh, we have done in the database. So basically, when we looked at what Couchbase database has, there are three workloads. So they have data workload, query, and index. What data does is a curled operation, which is a create, read, update, and delete operations, right? So uh, mainly a key, key value access, right? Uh, and then there's a query workload, which is you run a lot of queries on your database, right? You're running SQL statements, you're doing join, you're doing where clause, group by, and millions of all those, all those queries are running on the database, right? That's the query workload. And then there is a index workload, which is basically to make your queries run faster, your index is continuously building. It is up almost, uh, it's continuously updating its index, right? So this workloads, when we looked at, these workloads can be isolated from each other. Plus, this gives a benefit of uh, when you isolate them, you can scale them independently because the way you scale the, each of those workloads is also different. Because when you want to scale your data, you can add more containers, which are uh, memory-oriented containers and more resources from, from the memory perspective. But for data, for, for the query and index, you need uh, a container which is much uh, CPU intensive. Like, you, know, you scale up, basically, so that you have more resources to compute faster. So in some sense, like the diagram below here, what we do is like we have, uh, like, no, we have isolated this workload into separate services. They, uh, they, are, they work independently in some sense, like, the, like containers. Data is, uh, they, they scale horizontally. Index and query can be scaled uh, uh, vertically. Plus, they don't interfere with each other, right? Let's say if there is a long running query and it's taking, it's hogging the machine, it won't affect your index and, and data, right? So that's the isolation. Again, my intention was here to just give you an idea of like what uh, transformation we were bringing in the database itself and with the modern architecture. And this is kind of a very, uh, and again, the terminology we use here in, in the Couchbase is again, workload isolation, uh, uh, lightweight, uh, making them scale independently, easy scalability, right? So these are all the, the terminology we use for, uh, for Couch, Couchbase. <clears throat> so, sorry, before I go there, yeah. So um, Nicholas talked about the project we started with the, with the Amadeus and, and uh, Red Hat, right? Uh, the goal of this project was to get the Couchbase running on the OpenShift platform. Uh, we broke this project into two phases, the phase one and phase two, right? The goal of the phase one were basically, uh, as, I, as I listed it here, the goal was, first one was to get a, a production certified Couchbase container, which is RHEL-based, which is RHEL operating system-based, right? That was the first, uh, like, you know, first, uh, first requirement. Then we needed, uh, we basically need to provision the Couchbase cluster on the OpenShift uh, and, uh, platform. Because Couchbase has its own clustering mechanism, it has its own uh, orchestration, we wanted to basically make sure that the Couchbase can communicate with the OpenShift and deploys and gets distributed the way it works on the OpenShift, right? And I'll cover a little bit about that. Along with that, we wanted to support RAGZone awareness features, which is for high availability. 
uh, we wanted to uh, support for self-joining, which is like when you add a node, it automatically gets added to the uh, Couchbase cluster and is part of the cluster, right? Um, again, same thing with easy scalability. So because we are a shared nothing peer-to-peer -peer architecture, uh, when you add a node, it can automatically get rebalanced into the cluster. And finally, there was uh, the auto recovery feature. When a pod dies, and usually they do, you should be able to recover quickly and bring back your cluster to the capacity, right? <coughs> <coughs> so as I discussed, so provisioning, there were goals about, uh, so, uh, so Couchbase has its own uh, REST APIs. We have our own cluster management, uh, which basically makes sure that the, when you have a 10 node Couchbase cluster, it, uh, it distributes the data across all those 10 nodes. It monitors them. It, uh, it has all those same functionalities, right? When you do an upgrade, when you do the rolling upgrade, everything is, uh, Couchbase has its own orchestration technology. Now, how do we uh, communicate that with the uh, OpenShift, right? That's where, that's what the, 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 that was a challenge which we had in the, in the beginning. Is like, how do we get uh, efficient communication between the OpenShift and the Couchbase, right? Uh, uh, and also I talked about the, the workload isolation. So basically, we wanted to have a separate pods for different roles. Like for example, we have index, data index and query. We wanted to have a separate pod for each of them, right? So that we can have a, we can scale them independently, we can have isolation, right? So now I'll get into the design of uh, what, we came up, what we came up with, right? So they, they, the, whole, uh, the whole part of the provisioning of Couchbase cluster uh, the whole design of this project was basically uh, can come into three points. The one is the stateful set, which I think Gabriel talked about it. Then there is a uh, dynamic uh, volume provisioning, and then there is a sidecar container, right? And I'll cover all three of them. So it, uh, the stateful set, as Gabriel mentioned, it's um, it's a new, it's a basically it's a new pet new pet set basically, right? So it is a, still in a tech preview in OpenShift 3.5. Uh, <clears throat> The, in a single statement, uh, what Stateful Set provides you is a unique identity, right? And it's, it provides you a unique identity and a storage for a pod. And also it uh, guarantees the deployment ordering and also the uh, scaling, of, scaling of those pods, right? So basically unique identity, uh, storage for the pods, and then <clears throat> deployment ordering because you know which, which pod is first one, which pod is second one, so it orders them. And then the final one is it scales also them, right? So basically, stateful set was kind of a, uh, we were waiting for this stateful set, because before stateful set, we had to use the replication controller, we had to use, um, so there was manual work required to uh, basically uh, like, you know, create, a, create a disk, uh, set this scaling factor. All of this was part of the manual work, right? Uh, with, the sta with the stateful set, now this is all natively supported in, in, the, in the OpenShift environment itself. Right? So basically, it's like uh, for database, we were just waiting for the stateful set. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> and I mentioned about dynamic volume. So what dynamic volume, uh, dynamic volume provisioning provides is uh, its ability to automatically provision the, uh, the, the persistent volume, right? For stateful, con stateful controller, what it does is it creates a claim, like the, the persistent volume claim, and once the claim is created, it automatically, dynamically allocates the provision uh, persistent volume for those pods, right? So I have an, a diagram which shows you the, for each pod, we will have a persistent volume associated with that. With what it, provides, what it, does, what it does is like when the pod dies, uh, when the new pod comes in, so basically it can attach it to the, the same persistent volume, right? So we, we, can, we can reconsider the entire data which was on the persistent volume. There, are, there is other, another mechanism also. Uh, we know about the, uh, the, uh, each of these OpenShift uh, pods, each of them have a empty DIR, which is basically a local volume for each pod. We can even use that mechanism. What it provides is like it's much faster because it's like local to the, the, uh, the pod. Uh, because Couchbase has durability in the sense like we can create a multiple replicas of the Couchbase on the different pods. When a particular pod dies, we still have already replicated the data to the other pods, and we can still survive because like, you know, we have replicas on the other node which gets activated and take the traffic, right? So in some sense, like, we can have a two mechanism here. So one is you can use the empty DIR if you want performance, better performance. But if you want a persistent volume, which is like uh, pod, uh, my pods die quite frequently, but I want more, uh, more resiliency, then in that case, you can use the dynamic uh, provi uh, volume provisioning, right? So I talked about the third one, which is sidecar container. What is sidecar container? 
So sidecar container is a helper container, right? So this is a helper container which enhances and extends your main container. In case of our, uh, in our, in our project, the sidecar container's job is ma mainly uh, you know, configure the Couchbase container, right? It is the bridge between the uh, OpenShift environment and Couchbase. It's all the communication which is happening between the OpenShift and Couchbase is taken care of by the side sidecar. For example, uh, let's say if you are adding a new pod to the uh, OpenShift environment. So when a new pod gets uh, provisioned, so uh, the sidecar gets, you know, basically it makes a call to the Couchbase cluster and says, hey, there's a new pod and uh, this instance has to be added to the cluster, right? That call to the Couchbase cluster, all the communication between that is all taken care of by the sidecar. So essentially the sidecar is our, uh, is, is a is bridge between the bridge or communication between the OpenShift environment and Couchbase. And with this, this is the design, which is basically, if you look at, we have a Couchbase pod. Uh, each pod will have two containers, one which is Couchbase container, which is our server, and then there's a sidecar uh, configuration container, right? So all, um, in, in, when you look at the whole cluster, we'll have the same homogeneous cluster, which is like every pod will have two containers, <coughs> right? Plus, the, uh, if you have picked the dynamic uh, volume provisioning, then we will have the persistent volume associated with each pod. And then, uh, as Gabriel showed the diagram, when the pod dies and the new pod comes in another node, it can reattach it to the, the, the volume. Right? So this is the, at a high level the, the architecture of how uh, we designed the, the you know, provisioning Couchbase cluster on the OpenShift. Right? Now I would like to, uh, and I, and I, go, I know you guys will be eagerly waiting for the demo. So we have a demo set up, and hopefully the demo got, uh, it works out well. So I have the demo set up on the AWS. So let me show you. So I have a um, demo set up on the AWS, which is like uh, OpenShift uh, platform running on the, uh, this is the OpenShift 3.5, which is running on the, on the AWS. Uh, we have, uh, so have this project, empty project, which I have created. So I'll start the project. So again, this is, I have prepared already. The, so the build, uh, we have built this, we have created a new templates and it's all in the GitHub. And we will be soon open sourcing this uh, GitHub location so that we can even get the contribution from the community, right? So I have loaded the templates. So let me start the project. So add project. So if I scroll down, there is a data store. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the template you see there is uh, Couchbase stateful set persistent, right? Here, this is the, the template. Uh, let me select this template. Uh, it will ask you a lot of parameters like namespace, Couchbase, uh, the username, password, um, and again, if you don't want to change anything, you can leave them uh, empty, so it uh, automatically populates them. Plus, I was, uh, uh, so to just to demonstrate, I can reduce this number of nodes, so the data nodes can be one, I can start with one, and then there is uh, index node one, and then the query node as one. And also I mentioned about dynamic uh, volume provisioning. That's, uh, so when we, when, we, when we put the storage class for data nodes, in this case we have, uh, this is EBS, uh, like SSD, so that is GP2. So, uh, if we, uh, so it's, it's already configured. So when we select the uh, dynamic volume provisioning, it automatically has the, uh, associates the, pro the persistent volume for those ports, right? So I think this is good enough and I click on so create. So it'll start, creating this project, so it's gonna add um, pods, it will basically set up, this, set up the cluster. In the interest of time, I have another cluster which is already set up, so I just want to switch to the other project which is already set up because usually the pod takes time to uh, like, you know, start up the pods and automatically add to the cluster. So this is a cluster which I had already created for the demo itself. So here, let me show you uh, the stateful sets. So as I mentioned, so there are three uh, stateful sets so because we had three roles, one data role, one index, and one query. So these three roles, uh, we have a three different state, stateful sets for them because each of them can be scaled independently, scaled differently, right? So we have, a, for data, we, you can see there are three replicas. For index, we have one replica, we have uh, one replica for a query, right? Which means like we have four nodes, uh, we have three nodes for data, we have one node for index, one node for query. <coughs> So now let's look at pods. So all of them are healthy. All of them are running fine. So you can see that uh, the status is running. So if I switch, if you want to, now uh, this is all the OpenShift console, right? Now let's say if I want to switch to the Couchbase console and see what's happening on the Couchbase side, 
uh, can uh, go to one of these nodes, go to the environment. Uh, get, I need all I need is a username, and uh, have already opened it here. So this is the username here, and password. Okay. So let me log in. Yeah. So by the way, this is a our old UI, but uh, if we have we are working on our major release and. And you'll see the entirely new, brand new UI with the uh, our upcoming release, right? So this is our dashboard uh, where it shows you like you no, know, uh, just a the overview of uh, what your cluster looks like. And if I go to server page, you'll see uh, it's so we have uh, these three data nodes, and then there is index node and query node. And I mentioned you earlier about uh, we wanted to also have high availability, right? So we wanted to basically use make use of rack zone awareness feature in Couchbase. What rack zone awareness feature provides you is like, let's say I'll switch to the server groups here. What rack zone awareness feature does is like basically, uh, it does the placement of the pods in a different availability zones. In case of uh, AWS, we have three availability zones and we have placed those pods in a different availability zones. So what happens is, let's say if you lose entire uh, availability zone, let's say in this case, uh, uh, EU West 1A, we lose the entire availability zone. We still have 100% of our availability of data because the other availability zones are still active, and we have uh, placed place the replicas on the other other parts on the other uh, availability zones. So even if we lose two racks, we still be able to run with 100% capability. Right? So, so this is an awesome feature because we can combine the uh, rack, rack zone awareness feature of Couchbase with the availability zones on the cloud. Right? So now I'm, like, let me um, add a couple of. Uh, like n uh, nodes to the data and show you how uh, the, you know the, uh, the 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 data gets added to the, the data node gets added to the cluster right so you yeah, go to the uh, application uh, go to the uh, stateful set uh, sorry go to the pods uh, my bad here server yeah so going to the uh, I think I'm here data so one of the things which we can do is like right now we have three pods running, and if I edit the YAML file here, and one of the uh, like uh, uh, the key you see is replicas. If I change it to phi, and save, so now the OpenShift is provisioning two more pods to the environment. Now what happens on the Couchbase side? And again, the whole thing is automated. Like we don't have to do any manual work, and that was that was the main benefit of like. As uh, Nicholas was mentioning, is like everything is automated. Uh, automation, automation is the mantra for for uh, enterprise, right? So uh, there will be one ops guy sitting on the on on the, for this whole whole deployment, and everything is like you know taking care. So if I refresh this browser, you will start seeing uh, there are two new ports, and it usually takes a little bit of time because of network. Uh, and again, this is running on the European uh, data center, so. So two new pods will show up here, and then they automatically get rebalanced into the cluster, right? So and again, there's no manual intervention. Uh, we do have some we have some work to do in terms of like uh, let's say if the 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 operation fails. So as you saw, there's one got provision which is still in the pending state. We don't automatically add. We we keep keep them in the pending state when they are completely ready. We add them to the cluster, right? So and then they are already added to the cluster now. So you'll see that they have uh, there are two new nodes, new pods, or new instances added to the cluster. Right? The whole operation was kind of a seamless operation. Uh, similarly, I can do the same thing. Uh, let's say if I want to, uh, like, uh, uh, I don't need that much of. I, I, let's say if I have five nodes and uh, right now it's not a peak time, and I want to reduce my capacity to, like, say, two nodes or three nodes, I could do that operation right from here, which is like I go to YAML. Uh, and then re reduce it to, let's say, three. Let's see, it's ready for now. Just give me one sec. Let's give it a, uh, another second. And I think once this get, node gets added, I can, um, like, OK, yeah, so it's got added. Now if I reduce it to three and save, basically it scales down from five to three uh, instantaneously. Right? So you saw that it's all the, two, uh, the other two nodes went away. Right? So, you can scale them. It's basically elastic, right? So you can add more nodes when you need more capacity. You can scale them down when you don't need them. So it's a seamless operation in that case. One thing which I wanted to highlight here is if I go to monitoring, uh, if I go to the uh, yeah, sorry, one second. If I go to the data nodes, and I mentioned you earlier about the design where 
every pod has two containers, one Couchbase container and there's a side, sidecar container. Then now let's take a look at what's happening on the uh, sidecar container. <clears throat> so if I switch to some terminal and, and go to the sidecar, sorry. Um, So if I go to the logs, uh, so this is the, again, this is a pretty UI, which is, gives you visibility into what's happening on those containers itself. And this is a very useful tool, uh, because you want to debug, you want to know what's happening on the containers, you can just go to this, log, uh, this monitoring page. So here, if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so all those communication, which is happening between the OpenShift environment and Couchbase is getting logged here, right? So, uh, so the, for example, the uh, two operations I did just now, right? So I added two nodes, and then I re removed two nodes. All of that is you know, behind the scene. It's making a REST API call to Couchbase, right? So there's this new two nodes getting added. Uh, so there is a, uh, hold on. Yeah, so there's basically, uh, so there are add node commands, and there is a rebalance command, and all of them is getting logged here, right? So all those communication between, uh, and again, this is all happening on the sidecar which is a configuration or a, a kind of a helper container, a container which is helping out all those operations, right? Okay, so now switching back to here. Um, so, okay, one thing which I mentioned about earlier is a dynamic uh, volume provisioning, right? So every pod will have its own persistent volume. Uh, so when we, when I, uh, so this template is already configured in such a fashion that when I created those data nodes and index node, each of them have their own persistent volume, right? So when I lose a pod, let's say if I, uh, I, I lost a pod because the, the node which, where it is running, that node dies, and the pod on those uh, node dies. Now when a new pod comes in on another node, it can attach to one of those uh, the, you know, the persistent volumes. All right, okay. So that's all I had from the demo perspective. Uh, switching back to the slide. Good. You're on video. Okay, so thanks, Daniel. <coughs> okay, better. So I don't, I don't know what you think, but that's pretty. I mean, that's pretty elegant. That's pretty sexy. You don't really need to know what is Couchbase and how it works. As soon as you know templates and OpenShift, you can already create your cluster. It's rack aware, so it will create your server groups automatically. So I think that's that's real cool cool thing that we achieved. Uh, so now, what are the next steps? We said that's just the first phase that we represented you. So we wanted to be able to provision our Rackware cluster and to scale it out and scale it down, things like that. Uh, now these days we're talking about what will be included in the second phase. Uh, so maybe it will be being able to upgrade a cluster because today it's not possible, uh, or maybe cross data center replication, which is pretty complex when you deploy. A uh, two different couch-based clusters and two different OpenShift clusters. That's pretty, pretty complex. Uh, automatic failure recovery now we, it was done in the first phase, so that, that works. Uh, monitoring and alerting, uh, being able you know, to retrieve the couch-based metrics through OpenShift, that's something that we were discussing, or being able to manage the backup and restore of your data stores through OpenShift. That's, today that doesn't exist, you know, it doesn't make any sense in OpenShift, but we're trying to discuss, uh, to discuss about it with Red Hat and see how we could uh, integrate this stuff. I uh, just have one last point, which is an important one. Today we only talked about Couchbase, but uh, what we want, we said, is to have a common interface for all the data stores. And to achieve this, uh, this goal, we need to work with the different data stores. So we are also working uh, with MariaDB, and uh, the project is just as far advanced uh, as, far advanced as the Couchbase is. Uh, we started to work with MongoDB, that's just the start of the project, but we're also in touch with them. Uh, Enterprise DB, we didn't work with them, but they already on their own provided a solution that is compliant with OpenShift, so you can already use Enterprise DB, that's PostgreSQL that is uh, underneath uh, in OpenShift. And with Oracle, they were not really into the idea, so yeah, so we had to do it ourselves. It's actually Clément, who's right here, who, who's working on it. And I think now we showed them what we did, and they are maybe a bit more interesting than they used to. Yeah, yeah, so we'll see where it goes. But the point is, we're trying to, to work all together to come up with a solution that makes sense. Uh, so that's in this, the end of the presentation. In this slide, there are all the people that were involved in the project because it was not just the three of us, it was m many people. So thanks to everyone, thanks for the, the hard work. 
and we have, I think, one minute left for the question, something like that, and then we can go for lunch. So you're saying that before stateful sets it was possible to deploy Couchbase in it? Ah, it wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah we, you need stateful sets. If it's only one instance. Of yeah, if it's one instance, you yeah. can do it, but that's not really the point yeah. of a it's cluster, not the right? Clustered version of, of Couchbase. Uh, so then you need, as soon as you need a cluster, you need the stateful sets to, to make it work because you have this unique identity that you need. You know, actually, the, the thing is, if you, don't, if you don't have this unique identity, when you lose your pod, it comes back with a different name. So from the cluster point of view, it doesn't belong to the cluster. So you, when you lose it and it's rescheduled, you want to keep the same name to, to understand that it's still part of the cluster and this, it's the same pod. Yeah, so, yeah, so no, actually it's a kind of a necessity because by design, uh, we want to like, basically uh, all the operations, I, as I mentioned in the earlier, right? So all the operation which happens on the, uh, on the coach phase, we need to call a specific APIs for that, right? So again, uh, right now, the first phase was about provisioning, and as uh, uh, Nicholas mentioned, there's a lot of other things we want to do, right? So we need Sidecar to be the uh, helper class which does all those communication with OpenShift and on Couchbase. So it's kind of a, uh, by design, I think that that's the design of uh, the whole project. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for that.